There was once a boxer who danced in the ring. A boxer who danced to his own tune for as long as he kept on winning. A boxer called Sugar Ray Robinson. Like most boxing legends, the story begins at the bottom. Black Bottom, Detroit, where in 1921, Walker Smith, the youngest of three children, was born. Walker Smith Sr. was a hard-working, hard-drinking man. He fought with his wife, Layla. At the height of the Depression, she left him, taking her young family with her and ending up in New York's Hell's Kitchen. From Black Bottom to Hell's Kitchen. That was Walker Smith's childhood. In between jobs as a shoeshine boy and a window cleaner, young Walker Smith earned a few extra pennies as a street dancer. A lover of jazz and dancing, he dreamt as a teenager of becoming the new Bill Bojangles Robinson, a dancer who had tapped his way to stardom. Walker Smith's other idol also knew how to use his feet and his fists, future heavyweight champion Joe Lewis. They first met in Detroit, when the skinny young fan carried his hero's gym bag. That was the advantage boxing had over dancing. It was a lot cheaper to learn. Walker Smith began his own rise to glory under an assumed name. With no amateur license of his own, he entered his first fight using one belonging to a certain Ray Robinson. The sugar was added soon after when people saw his sweet boxing style. The real Ray Robinson ended his days working behind a bar. 1939, world heavyweight champion Joe Lewis referees the American amateur featherweight final. In trademark white shorts is Lewis's 18-year-old protege, Sugar Ray Robinson. The dancer who became a fighter believed that the essence of boxing was balance and rhythm. But Robinson's fists also did their share of the work. A year later, the featherweight traded up to lightweight. The speed of his combination punches was already notorious. In 1940, America's most popular amateur turned professional. When the money got serious, Robertson began to live the high life. At the Cotton Club, he met dancer Edna May Holly, the future Mrs. Robinson. Back in the ring, another important relationship with Jake LaMotta, a fighter whose career would intersect with Robinson's throughout the 40s and 50s. In February 1943, the day after the third robinson Lamotta fight, Sugar Ray Robinson became Private Walker Smith. 
For Sergeant Joe Lewis, patriotism and service to his country counted for a lot. For Private Smith, war was a mere interlude, and army life something of a joke. Sugar Ray Robinson was already making plans for his golden age, the post-war years when the going would be good. By 1946, with 60 victories and 61 fights, Robinson was welterweight champion in all but name. But the promoters controlled the ring and decided who got a shot at the title. A king without a crown, Robinson had no choice but to wait for the call. Six years after turning professional, all he had to show for his string of victories was money, which disappeared as fast as he could win it. But finally he got his chance against Tommy Bell, a man he'd beaten before. It took him 15 rounds to defeat Bell, but at last, five days before Christmas 1946, Sugar Ray Robinson was welterweight champion of the world. Six months later, Robinson fought Jimmy Doyle. Doyle went down in round eight and never got up again. It later emerged that Doyle had been damaged in a previous fight. But when asked by journalists whether he had intended to hurt him, Robinson said, it's my job to hurt him. Unlike many who covered the sport, Robinson himself refused to romanticize boxing. Doyle lost his life in pursuit of a title. Another fighter lost his honor. Robinson's old adversary, Jake LaMotta, who would throw a fight to get a shot at the middleweight crown. In the late 1940s, middleweight boxing was where the action was. The crowds, the cameras, the money, and the mob. Entry to this battleground was controlled by promoter Jim Norris of the International Boxing Club, which ran Madison Square Garden. Norris was hand in glove with the mob. Jake LaMotta paid the entry price for a shot at the middleweight crown by throwing a fight against Billy Fox. Robinson, who had beaten LaMotta in four out of five fights, was offered a similar deal, but refused. It wasn't a question of morality. He just didn't like the idea of anyone controlling his freedom to cut his own deals. So Robinson had to take a roundabout route to the middleweight class. In 1950, he accepted an invitation to fight in Europe. The money was good, and if he kept on winning, he would become the challenger it was impossible to ignore. On the boat over to Europe, Robinson heard the word entourage used to describe the half dozen or so people who, as usual, had accompanied him. He adopted the word with enthusiasm. In Paris, the entourage was supplemented by Jimmy Karubi, who acted as interpreter, court jester, and mascot. The French love affair with America, which had begun on Liberation Day, was consummated by the arrival of Robinson and his exotic crew. For Robinson, the passion was mutual. He said later that France had treated him like an artist and made him feel like a hero. 
But Robinson was in Europe to fight, and Jean Stock was planning to live up to his nickname, the Unstoppable. In the American ring, Robinson had on occasion carried fighters, allowing them to go the distance rather than knocking them out. It was the kind of accommodation with well-connected gamblers that every fighter had to make. But in Europe, Robinson carried no one, and national champions hit the canvas in record time. In just 29 days, he won five fights, four of them by knockout. He earned $50,000 and spent most of it keeping his entourage in the style to which they had become accustomed. He also made himself an irresistible contender for the middleweight title, and there was nothing that Jim Norris could do about it. The only person who could stop him now was Jake LaMotta the Bronx Bull. Having paid the price to win the champion's belt, he was in no mood to give it up. Chicago, 14th of February, 1951. The sixth encounter between Robinson and LaMotta. To defeat the Bronx Bull, Robinson decides to play the matador, keeping his distance, flicking quick jabs to keep the beast at bay. Lamotta, who has never been fast on his feet, is slower than ever. When Robinson picks up the pace, the bull struggles to keep up. Robinson targets the liver. Lamotta is hurt, his legs rooted to the canvas. Now Robinson begins to dance, punctuating his steps with left hooks to Lamotta's face and throwing lethal combination punches. Round 11, Lamotta has soaked up a lot of punishment, but now he counterattacks with a flurry of punches. But Robinson weathers the storm and is soon playing the matador once more. called it the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and it was Robinson who inflicted most of the damage. The referee stopped the massacre in round 13. Robinson, the irresistible challenger, was middleweight champion of the world, and he'd done it on his own terms free from the control of Jim Norris and the mob. In his trademark pink Cadillac, the champ tours the little piece of Harlem that is now his own personal kingdom. Ray Robinson Enterprises consists of Edna May's lingerie shop a hairdressing salon, a real estate business, and a bar. $300,000 worth of the American dream. 
Robinson had seen too many fighters end up with nothing to show for their bruises except broken noses and scrambled brains, or like Jimmy Doyle, flat on their backs, dying in the ring. He had no intention of joining their ranks. True to a promise, Robinson returned to Paris as champion. The love affair between France and America's unofficial ambassador resumed. Robinson played the part to perfection, accompanying the gift of $10,000 for cancer research with a kiss for Madame Oriol, the wife of the French president. But as ever, Robinson had work to do, this time against British champion Randy Turpin in London. Unlike the French public, Turpin was no pushover. The son of a bare-knuckle fighter from the West Indies, he proved a totally unexpected roadblock on what was supposed to be the champion's triumphant European tour. Turpin was tough and strong, but no stylist. In a huddle, his head collided with Robinson's, and the champion started to bleed. The final round. Bleeding from a cut above the eye, and worn out from too many Parisian late nights, Robinson now realizes that coming to London had been a big mistake. And then it's over, and the champion is champion no longer. Ignoring the headbutt that cost him his crown, Robinson told reporters after the fight, I have no alibis. I was beaten by a better man. In Turpin's hometown of Leamington Spa, they'd never seen anything quite like it. We congratulate him on his great victory, which makes him middleweight champion of the world. In New York, there was only the consolation of dignity in defeat. In defeat. You were still a champion, and you conduct yourself the way Americans like to know Americans conduct themselves when they're overseas. When you said, you were a better man than I am, or than I was tonight. I put that in the paper, sugar, and I added, you see, no sour grapes in Germany. Sugar Ray Robinson was the challenger once more. At his training center at Pompton Lakes, he planned his revenge. As champion, he had always insisted on a contract that allowed for a rapid return fight in the event of defeat. Randy Turpin had just 64 days before Robinson would come looking to get his title back. thousand people were there to witness the rematch, including his old friend Joe Lewis and General Douglas MacArthur. The challenger, Sugar Ray Robinson! From the start, it was clear that Robinson's training had done the trick. He was faster than ever on his feet, and before long, Turpin was looking a long way from home.
By the tenth round, Robinson was well ahead, but the cut above his eye was threatening to reopen. It was now or never. Thirty-one punches in 25 seconds finally put an end to Turpin's 64-day reign. He would never come close to regaining the title. A decade later, bankrupt and in despair, Randy Turpin would take his own life. But at Sugar Ray's that night, the thoughts are only of what boxing can give not of what it can take away. Having won his title back, Robinson had no intention of ending up a loser. In December 1952, aged 31, he retired. Reasonably rich, extremely successful, and relatively unscarred. In his house in the Bronx, former champion Sugar Ray Robinson finally has the chance to realize the dream of the young Walker Smith to make it as a dancer. Guided by his agent, Joe Glazer, Robinson launched into a new career, relieved to learn that dancers with his unusual pedigree could expect to earn $15,000 a week. Once more, it was to France that he turned for approval, taking his review to the French casino in Paris. But though they loved the boxer, the French were less kind to the dancer. Sugar Ray Robinson was no Bill Robinson, and the good money soon dried up. And despite stage-managed appearances, Robinson's relationship with Edna May began to founder as years of womanizing took their toll. A lot of my fans are wondering, in regards to my intentions of boxing again, as yet, I have not made up my mind. Robinson had always said he had no intention of ending up broke. But by the end of 1954, less than two years after his retirement, that looked a distinct possibility. Robinson's nemesis was the tax man. Years of $100,000 fights had led to years of unpaid taxes. Now it was payback time for Uncle Sam and the IRS. Jim, it's common gossip when a fighter makes a return to the ring that he's broke, desperately in need of finances. Well, that's somewhat true. I need a buck as well as anyone else, I guess. But this wasn't, was definitely not the reason that I made this comeback attempt while enjoying a very successful engagement in Paris at one of the better theaters there, in show business, that is, I got the urge that I wanted to fight again. My legs and arms and my sight, everything worked together. My coordination was still uh, in my possession. Then here we are. Come on, let's go. Come on. Don't be lazy, Ned. Come on, move. Move around. That's it. Come on, come on, come on. Let's go. Come on. Don't be lazy, Ned. Come on, move. Move around. Move around. Come on. Nothing much had changed since he'd been away. The ring was still no place for the faint-hearted.
It's July 1955 in San Francisco. In his sixth fight since his comeback, Robinson is just one victory away from a shot at the middleweight crown. But that night against Rocky Castellani, victory seems a long way away. close call, but Robinson had earned himself another shot at the World Middleweight Championship. Defending champion was Carl Bobo Olsen. December 9, 1955, three years after he retired, Sugar Ray Robinson is middleweight champion for the third time. But despite the elation, Robinson is full of bitterness for those in his own camp who had doubted his chances. is entirely happy that night, seizing all of the new champion's $50,000 purse. Perhaps Jim Norris is happy too, because this time around, Robinson is champion on terms set by the International Boxing Club, to whom he is now exclusively signed. After the fight, Robinson makes it clear who's in control now. <laughs> I'm proud of you, Ray, and what you did tonight certainly is I think giving boxing a great lift. Oh, yeah. I, I'm proud of you. Thanks a lot, Jim. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm proud to have you proud of me. Could you tell us now what your plans are? I don't know. I'm asking Jim Norris. What are my plans? <laughs> <laughs> Between Jim Norris and the taxman, Robinson's plans, like his winnings, have been reduced to the barest minimum. Defend the title, and if you lose it, as in this case against Gene Fulmer, make your excuses and prepare for the rematch. It's a very unorthodox emotion, uh, shall I say. It's rather hard to cope with, but I hope between now and the time we fight again that I can go to school and find the answers. Six months later, Challenger and Champ square up once again. It's Robinson's 148th professional fight. He's 36 years old. Fulmer, the Champ, is 11 years younger. But true to his word, Robinson has been back to school to study Gene Fulmer. He knows now that when Fulmer strikes for the body, his guard drops. For a seasoned fighter, Knowledge is power. Middleweight champion for the fourth time. No one else in the history of boxing has done that before.
This is the reward, Carmen Basilio, one of Jim Norris's favorite fighters. Welterweight champion Basilio, like Robinson before him, now has his sights on the middleweight crown. Thanks to television, the audience has never been bigger. The stakes have never been higher. Wearing white trunks, weighing 160, middleweight king, Sugar Ray Robinson. 15 rounds for the middleweight championship of the world. From the start, it's clear that both fighters have come to give their all. One because he wants to reach the top, the other because he can't afford to come down. But despite being tailor-made for television, the fight is no showcase. Robinson can't dance like he used to. Instead, he pounds away at Basilio's weak point, his battered brow. But Basilio just keeps coming forward and uses Robinson as a punch bag. By round 13, it doesn't look as if Robinson has done enough to keep the young challenger at bay. The final bell will confirm the verdict. The taxman will collect the winnings. Jim Norris will plan the rematch. The other judge, Bill Wrecked, scores it. Eight, six, one even, the winner and new middleweight champion of the world, Carmen Basilio. The sport that set Robinson free had by now become a treadmill. The little money that he could claw back from the IRS was barely enough to keep hold of what his fists had won. These are the hands that built the house. And though the TV cameras suggest that everything Shea Ray is sweetness and light, Edna May could tell a different story of infidelity and cruelty. For Robinson, there were few illusions left about his chosen career. I've never enjoyed boxing. I, uh, I just, it's just a business with me, and I guess I just, I know I've never enjoyed it. In fact, as a kid, uh, I never had a street fight, Ed. I think that that's not the way to solve anything by fighting. I think uh, it reminds me of the old, uh, something barbaric, when two people get in a pit and they throw money at them and they fight. Ray, you going to fight again? March 1958, the rematch against Basilio. Robinson insists that Norris pay him in cash in an attempt to blindside the taxman. At first, 
it doesn't look as if Robinson has anything new to bring to the problem of Carmen Basilio. Weakened by a virus, he targets Basilio's brow. Same story as before. But this time, persistence pays off. Robinson's punches are turning the champion into a cyclops. The fighter who swore he would never become a blood-spilling machine targets the grotesquely swollen eye. Robinson has nothing else to offer. commentator called it a fight between a mole and a hawk, but there was little natural in this gruesome spectacle. for an unprecedented fifth time, Robinson, the legend, comes to the home of legends, Hollywood. Did you uh, happen to catch the uh, welterweight title fight the other night, Ray? I'm awfully sorry to say I didn't. I'm, I'm just not a fight fan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How long are you going to be here, Ray? Well, it's hard to say. I intend to see, see several people here in the studios and uh, um, I'm interested in some motion picture work. And um, I don't know just how long it'll take me. I intend to see as many as I possibly can. But the film about his life will never be shot. Another escape route from the ring closes down. Washington, 1959. For Jim Norris and the sport that he dominated, there was no escape either from a past full of shady deals and fixed fights. Robinson's old rival, Jake LaMotta, took the stand to expose the means by which Norris's champions were made. He just said that if I would lose to Fox, that I could get $100,000. He knew that I wasn't interested in it, but he had to give me the message. But towards the end, when I realized that I couldn't possibly win, I, uh, I uh, said I would lose to Billy Fox if I, if I was guaranteed a championship fight. No names to give. Well, there's no names to give, sir. No one's told you that if you come down here and uh, give us names that Something might happen to you or members of your family. No, sir. This is a pretty rough crowd, isn't it, Mr. Lamarta? What is it? This, these people engaged in this uh, boxing business? I'm not afraid of none of them rats. You're not afraid of any of them? No, sir. Nineteen sixty-one, a new decade and a new era for boxing. Robinson puts on a show in a Boston department store as he prepares for yet another championship bid. He'd lost the title at the beginning of 1960, just as the boxing world fell apart. Norris's International Boxing Club had been dismembered, a victim of antitrust laws, and now it's harder than ever to become a champion. 
a fragmentation of governing bodies, a multiplication of middleweight titles, more and more fights just to get back to the position of challenger. A lethal hook sends Robinson crashing into the ropes, the prelude to an awesome thrashing at the hands of Gene Fulmer. It's the 4th of March, 1961, and though he doesn't know it, Sugar Ray Robinson has just lost his last chance at a title. still love the man they call Le Sucre Merveilleux, but the woman who met him when he was a 20-year-old champion in the making is no longer among his fans. Edna May and Sugar Ray are separated now. But Robinson is still on the treadmill, trying to string together a couple of victories that will give him a shot at the title. People said that by now he was fighting for memory but Robinson felt he had no choice. And so he drinks the beef blood that forms part of his pre-fight diet and continues to train for a $700 fight thousands of miles from home. This is my third trip to Great Britain. And I'm here in Scotland to fight Mickey Leahy September the 3rd. And I just gotta win this one because I'm sure this fight will lead me on to another chance at the middleweight championship. Boxing is a very rough sport, even for youngsters, or for a man at 43 afraid that I might get hurt. And often they wonder, they ask me, Sugar Ray, don't you ever feel that you'll get hurt? I believe all things are possible with God. And I believe that this was meant for me to fight and to wind up this career as champion. And now I'm trying to put together the final climax on the wonderful story. But by now, the story has moved on. All eyes are on a young heavyweight fighter called Cassius Clay. He's an even better dancer than Sugar Ray Robinson. Cassius Clay took the heavyweight title from Sonny Liston in February 1964. After the fight, with Robinson at his side, he acknowledged his debt in typical style. I watched Sugar Ray Robinson and Jake Lamont for three months. That's what I was at, the same fight. The one for Sugar Ray Robinson and Bo I got Bo with me. He was with Sugar Ray for 10 years. I've been having the best of the training. The bat couldn't hurt me. The bat couldn't even get a good lick on the hurting. Put him in the hospital. He's never been stopped. He's never been what? Oh, I'm so great. Oh, I'm so great. Oh, I'm so pretty. I took up the world. Man, I'm too tall. I'm too tall. Man, you write, you write the results. Cassius Clay now Muhammad Ali, became the brash voice of boxing in the 60s. Alongside him, Sugar Ray Robinson seemed like a ghost from a quieter age. In 1965, at Madison Square Garden, boxing gave its elder statesman a carefully choreographed ovation as he finally announced his retirement. Behind the scenes, Robinson, desperate for money, had wrangled about TV rights to the event. But in the ring, reunited with old opponents Turpin, Olsen, Fulmer and Basilio, 
sentimentality laced with genuine emotion reduced grown men to tears. Robinson was 44 when he finally retired. He had notched up more than 200 professional fights and had won and lost six championship titles. He had also won and lost a cool four million dollars. He was the bridge between two worlds, the worlds of Joe Lewis, the patriot, and Muhammad Ali, the dissident. Robinson was the dreamer who believed, for a while at least, in the dream that seduced all of America in the 1950s. At the end of his life, Robinson was stricken with Alzheimer's disease. He died on the 18th of April, 1989. 